renewable energy as part of the global response to climate change. It is important to see this hearing in the larger context. In his first address yesterday to the United Nations, President Obama highlighted the unprecedented investment in American renewables as a concrete sign of American progress on global warming. Uh, China's Premier Hu Jintao also made an important announcement at the UN, stating China's commitment to draw 15 percent of its total primary energy from non-fossil uh, sources by the year 2020. The announcement by China's Premier has been backed by billions of dollars, and, 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 uh, and there's more to come. Last week, the Speaker and I met with, uh, with uh, Mr. Wu, uh, who is the Chairman of the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress. He had just arrived from Arizona, uh, where they had signed an agreement with First Solar for a 2,000 megawatt photovoltaic farm to be built in the desert of Inner Mongolia. This will be the world's largest solar photovoltaic power plant project and is projected to cost nearly $5 billion. But it is only a small part of nearly 12,000 megawatt renewable energy park that is planned there as well. Thankfully, after years of neglect, America is no longer just watching other countries racing ahead. We are now making real strides to reclaim a leadership role in a technology that was invented on our shores. The Bureau of Land Management has received more than 150 large-scale solar plant applications with a projected capacity of 97,000 megawatts of electricity, mostly in the sunny Southwest. Imagine that. We have healthy competition for clean energy technology. Uh, between the barren steppe of Inner, Inner Mongolia and the hot desert of Nevada and Arizona. In just over 70 days, the nations will, uh, of the world will convene in Copenhagen to commit to solutions for the common good. Here in the United States, the need to position American industry for new areas of a long-term growth is also urgent. <coughs> as Americans across the country can attest, pink slips at work can be as personally devastating as the threat of melting ice caps, rising seas, and more frequent floods, droughts, and hurricanes. The climate and the economy are two challenges facing our country that will impact us globally and locally. Clean energy technology will be a key solution to both. The global transition to clean energy presents an opportunity for job creation in all areas of the country, solar power in the west and southwest, wind turbines in the plains, and Texas and offshore in New England and the Mid-Atlantic, biomass in the South and Northwest. All areas of the country have energy resources that can be made uh, and be used uh, that are plentiful, clean, renewable, affordable, and made in America. And that is a statement that cannot be said about most of the oil which we consume because uh, that comes marked with made by OPEC. We have taken the first step in assuring that these clean energy jobs stay in the United States and unleash a global energy revolution. In June, the House passed the Waxman-Markey American Clean Energy and Security Act. When enacted, this bill will cap the carbon pollution causing global warming, require the widespread deployment of renewable energy and energy efficiency, and invest $200 billion in energy technology. The clean energy revolution will not happen magically. We need to put in place the policies um, that uh, will accomplish that goal. I am pleased that we have such a distinguished group of panelists uh, that will be testifying today. Uh, let me turn now and recognize the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. There is no good or evil with energy sources because every <laughs> energy source carries distinctly different positives and negatives. Developing a new energy system from the ground up is proving to be an impossible task for policymakers. While solar power promises to deliver an endless supply of clean energy, high costs and other environmental concerns are raising significant problems. State mandates like California's renewable portfolio standard have led to small amounts of growth in the solar energy sector, but that growth is already being hindered by environmental concerns. Last week, Bright Source Energy was forced to give up 
its plan to build a 5,130-acre solar farm in the Mojave Desert after Democratic Senator Dianne Feinstein <coughs> responded with plans to make the area a national monument. Interior Secretary Ken Zalazar has met similar resistance with his plan <coughs> excuse me, to fast-track solar development on federal lands because of concerns that the development will disturb the habitat of federally protected wildlife. These issues stem from mandating the use of an energy source before the ramifications are fully understood. Spain's experience with renewable energy should serve as a cautionary tale. President Obama has frequently argued that we should look to Spain as an example of how taxpayer subsidies for renewable energy projects will create so-called green jobs. But economics professor Dr. Gabriel Calzada of Rey Juan Carlos University examined the Spanish policies and advises against adopting their approach. Professor Calzada's study questions the effectiveness of pumping massive subsidies into renewable energy. As the Washington Post reported yesterday, Spain's subsidies for photovoltaic solar power jumped from $320 million in 2007 to a billion six hundred million dollars last year. While the Spanish government argues that its subsidies created 200,000 jobs, Dr. Calzada found that for every job the subsidies created, they eliminated up to 2.2 more. Furthermore, only one in 10 of the newly created jobs proved to be permanent. Most were created to build infrastructure, but were no longer needed once it was done. I have often argued that there's no free lunch in our response to climate change. Dr. Calzada's study confirms this. He found that each newly created job in the solar industry cost the Spanish government and its taxpayers $855,000. Solar energy did initially thrive in response to Spain's massive government investment. However, in 2008, Spain withdrew the subsidies. With the subsidies gone, the solar bubble burst, and many of the new jobs were eliminated. In other words, the green jobs created by the subsidies proved to be anything but sustainable. The subsidies have also introduced market volatility. Professor Calzada found that Spain's subsidy of solar energy was 500 percent higher than the market price. While these subsidies thus far only caused modest rises in electricity prices, Spanish government officials are already warning that prices might suddenly jump as the true cost of these renewable energy projects reach consumers. I'm not against solar power. I am in favor of an all-of-the-above approach to energy production that includes solar power, along with wind, coal, hydropower, nuclear power, and increased energy efficiency. But I'm also opposed to government policies that pick winners and losers based on popular sentiments. And I'm opposed to policies that will increase our energy prices. Spain's massive use of government subsidies is not an all of the above approach, but rather an attempt to choose winners and losers. And the one last thing to consider before following Spain's lead on green jobs Spain's unemployment rate is currently 18.5% and growing. I look forward to hearing from today's witnesses about both the positive and negatives about rel relying on solar power, and I thank the chairman for the time. Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate my good friend from Wisconsin laying out a uh, fundamental difference in approach. Uh, you know, it's ironic, all American energy sources have been heavily subsidized at one point or another throughout their development. Uh, we have a long history of the federal government subsidizing everything from jet aviation, semiconductors, computers, the internet, uh, global positioning systems, laser technology, MRI, the list is extensive that has developed into major job engines in the United States. I find it a little frustrating that our friends have chosen not really to engage the issue directly of the hearing, but they're ignoring information provided by established, credible 
experts and pull out of right field a single report that uses unproven theories, unaccepted assumptions, lacks basic statistical analysis to show that a program that only does not exist in the United States and is not being proposed by anyone did not work. In my home state of Oregon, uh, we're watching, even though it, it rains all the time, we're watching an emergence of a solar energy industry. We're watching in New Jersey, um, the Garden State, where they have some climate issues, uh, the second largest uh, state of installations. We're moving in an era where it's expected that the solar uh, photovoltaic will soon achieve grid parity. But in an era when the United States, unlike what happened in the uh, technology <coughs> explosion, Mr. Chairman, that you were involved with, and actually our ranking member has been deeply concerned with, where the United States was an innovator and a global leader in energy technology today, uh, the United States has only four of the top 30 countries. The rest of the world is moving on. I think our witnesses here today uh, can help give a picture of where the world is going. And I appreciate your having this hearing because I think it's an important part of the picture to, f to round out. <coughs> I thank the gentleman very much. Time for opening statements of members has been completed. We'll turn to our panel. Our first witness is Steve Klein, Vice President for Corporate Environmental and Federal Affairs for the Pacific Gas and Electric uh, Company. Uh, we welcome you, sir. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you, Chairman Markey, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, and members of the committee. Uh, I'm delighted to appear before you on behalf of PG&E Corporation and its subsidiary Pacific Gas and Electric Company to offer some thoughts on this very important subject. As PG&E's Chief Sustainability Officer and Vice President of Corporate Environmental and Federal Affairs, I lead cli PG&E's climate change strategy programs as well as our habitat conservation planning programs. Investments in renewable resources, including solar resources, create jobs, reduce air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions, and move us toward a low-carbon economy. Vitally important is the support and role of the federal government in expanding the development of solar energy, including policies related to federal lands that can help or hinder renewable energy development. The federal government in the economic recovery package has made important investments to support and lay foundation for expanding renewable energy resources, including financial and program support. But there is an opportunity and a need to do more. Before going further, let me tell you just a bit about PG&E's support and development of solar and other renewable resources. Uh, we provide electric and gas service to approximately 15 million people throughout uh, a 70,000 square mile service area in Northern and Central California. We deliver some of the nation's cleanest energy. On average, approximately one half of the power that we, develop, uh, that we deliver to our customers uh, is carbon free. In 2008, approximately 12% of the electricity delivery mix uh, was from Cali California eligible renewable resources, uh, and we forecast that to rise to 15% uh, this year. We're actively pursuing a diverse portfolio of renewable generation resources on behalf of our customers, and I think the critical word there is portfolio. Since 2002, we've signed more than 66 contracts with existing and new facilities that use or plan to use wind, geothermal, biogas, biomass, and solar as their fuel. Solar energy is an especially attractive source for us because it's available when power is needed most in California during the peak midday summer period. Our portfolio includes both solar PV and solar thermal technologies. Since early 2008, We've entered into 14 solar contracts, five using solar PV technology, and nine using solar thermal or concentrated solar power technologies. In addition, we have a 500 megawatt photovoltaic program pending before the California Public Utilities Commission to help stimulate immediate renewable energy development through both distributed utility-owned generation and power purchase agreements with third parties. Given the current state of the capital markets, we'd strongly recommend further extending tax credits, grant programs, and loan guarantees. 
to help assure that we'll have the renewable energy resources we need to meet California's RPS and uh, we assume uh, soon a federal RPS obligation. We're also exploring the possibility of developing commercial scale projects ourselves. In addition, we support exploration of a green bank to provide longer term certainty and expanded options for financing renewable energy programs. Establish a clean, establishing a clean energy de deployment administration, as is being discussed in both the House and the Senate, would assist in reaching those goals. We're encouraged by the Department of Interior's actions to facilitate large-scale uh, production of renewables. Um, a positive step has been BLM's recent relief, a release of its draft scoping document for the programmatic environmental impact statement uh, for development of renewables uh, on public lands in the West. Uh, this study will uh, capture 24 solar energy study areas to expedite technologies that are ready for deployment at utility scale. Given the dual imperatives of reducing greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible and of bringing renewables online while protecting natural and cultural resources, we believe that federal agencies and their state agency analogs must proceed along two parallel paths. One path in the short term is identifying and permitting the solar projects most likely to be shovel ready in time to be eligible to receive stimulus funds. The other path is longer term, namely developing a process to manage solar development on public lands in a more orderly and comprehensive fashion. Clearly, a great deal is being asked of BLM staff in connection with this effort, uh, which we strongly support, to get more renewable energy generated online to consumers. It's critical that BLM have sufficient resources to ensure that these efforts can move forward in a timely and efficient manner, while ensuring robust environmental review. A sig significant challenge, and it won't be a surprise to this committee, that we face in bringing renewable energy online is the lack of transmission lines uh, located where um, resources are located. Across the West, thousands of miles of transmission lines will be needed to significantly expand renewable energy production and link those remote resources to areas where electricity is needed most where people live, including paths on or around federal lands. It'd be no exaggeration to say that only with increased transmission capacity can the benefits of renewable resources be fully realized. One way to facilitate that would be through better coordination among agencies. In addition to better coordination, streamlining the reviews required by state and federal agencies We appreciate the subcommittee's interest in these vital issues and look forward to working with you and other policymakers and stakeholders on this journey to find consensus. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Klein, very much. Our next witness is Frank DeRosa. He is the Chief Executive Officer of NextLight Renewable Power. We welcome you, sir. Thank you for the opportunity to speak about the progress and the challenges we face in developing large-scale solar generation. <clears throat> Next Light Renewable Power is a developer of competitively priced utility-scale solar generation. We're, we're not a technology company. We are, our expertise is, we're, we're power plant guys. Our expertise is in the siting, permitting, financing, construction, and operation of power plants. We apply the technologies to our projects uh, so as to provide the best products to our utility customers. Nextlight has approximately 1,000 megawatts of solar generation in development and permitting in the West, in Arizona, California, Nevada, and the other Western states. <clears throat> that is sufficient to meet the needs of approximately 200,000 residential homes. It would create about 1,500 construction jobs and one to 200 permanent jobs during operation. I have three main points today. First is to restore the $2 billion 
that was transferred to cash for clunkers back to the DOE loan guarantee program. The second is to extend the ITC grant beyond the December 2010 expiration date. And the third is to uh, establish the, the Green Bank. Now, why do we need these programs? Our biggest obstacle in developing these projects is the upfront capital cost of renewable energy generation. Without carbon costs explicitly included, when a utility looks at their, their supply portfolio, they they see renewable generation as more expensive than fossil. If we can close that gap, utilities would gladly procure more renewable generation, and more generation would get built without impacting electric rates. These three measures go a long way to close the gap at little taxpayer expense by reducing the financing costs of these projects. So very briefly, the loan guarantee program, $2 billion would accelerate $20 billion of renewable generation. The <laughs> ITC grant, it was enacted to address the current shortage of tax equity. But the fact is that the ITC grant is more efficient than the investment tax credit. Every dollar of the grant goes to a project as opposed to the, I, the investment tax credit where we need to bring in tax investors who require more than a dollar for a dollar of tax offset, and it requires a substantial uh, uh, structuring transaction costs to do these very complicated financing arrangements. We estimate that 15 to uh, 20, per, uh, 15 to 20 percent loss of uh, in, with the investment tax credit compared to the ITC grant. Lastly, the, uh, the Green Bank, which was passed by this House and, and is in, in the Senate here, uh, like the Export-Import Bank, it would, uh, the purpose would be to lend to renewables at rates, basically at federal rates. And if you look at the, uh, if you compare, say, a 5 percent rate uh, long-term debt rate under something like the Green Bank to the 8 or 9 percent interest rates in the market today, that translates to about 4 cents a kilowatt hour reduction in the cost of renewable generation. That's a lot. That's enough to close the gap between renewables and fossil generation. So it's the most cost-effective way to build renewable generation with minimal impact on electric rates or on the federal budget. So in conclusion, our biggest obstacle is the upfront cost of these very capital intensive projects. And Congress can materially reduce that cost without significant taxpayer expense by enacting the three points that I mentioned before. Thank you, Mr. DeRosa, very much. Our next witness is uh, uh, Nada Culver, she is the senior counsel at the Wilderness Society. Uh, she has many years of experience in environmental law. We welcome you. I'm on. <laughs> thank you, Chairman Markey and members of the committee, and thank you for pronouncing my name correctly. Wandering around <laughs> the Southwest with a name like this has been a yeah. challenge. Um, I work in the public lands campaign of the Wilderness Society. Our mission is to protect wilderness and inspire Americans to protect our wild places. For more than 70 years, we've worked to ensure that land management practices are sustainable and based on sound science. I lead a part of the organization called the BLM Action Center, which tracks land use planning and policy and is dedicated to helping the public effectively engage and participate. We appreciate the leadership that Chairman Markey and others on the committee have demonstrated in seeking clean energy solutions to the impacts of climate change through recently passed legislation. <coughs> You've asked us to present testimony today regarding how public lands can contribute to these solutions through large-scale solar energy development. My written statement lays out in a lot of detail the key considerations for the Wilderness Society. Today, uh, my testimony is going to focus on our optimism regarding the direction that Secretary Ken Salazar is already leading us in. 
Our wildlands and our communities are threatened by global warming and our reliance on fossil fuels. We see solar energy development and other sources of renewable energy as an important part of responding to these threats. And the public lands have a role to play. Secretarial Order 3285 set the stage for a new approach to energy development on the public lands, focusing on development and transmission of renewable energy from appropriate areas. This thoughtful approach is reflected in the ongoing uh, efforts of the Department on Solar Energy, and we hope, honestly, to see it apply to other types of energy development. The key elements of this strategy are identifying the places that are most appropriate for large-scale development while protecting places that are not appropriate or needed, providing the financial tools needed to incentivize responsible development, and proactive involvement of other interested and knowledgeable parties. A robust program in this model would be able to increase the likelihood of timely approval of projects and decrease the unacceptable environmental impacts and the resulting controversy and opposition to projects that come with that. Secretary Salazar has committed the department to identifying and prioritizing the specific locations in the United States best suited for large-scale production. This is really the centerpiece for responsible development, locating it in the right places and with the right protection. The department's commenced a programmatic environmental impact statement for solar energy and is designating solar energy zones that will be prioritized. These zones um, are, are being designated with important criteria, both for proximity to transmission and suitability of terrain and potential for energy, but also by, from the start, excluding sensitive resources from consideration. Resources like the BLM's National Landscape Conservation System and critical habitat for endangered species. Because solar energy development involves long-term use of land, damage to natural resources, and really effectively precludes other uses, it is, real, it is extremely important for it to be directed to lands that do not have other sensitive resources. And for example, um, Next Lights, Silver State North and South projects in Nevada are being cited to avoid BLM areas of critical environmental concern and lands proposed by citizens for wilderness protection. <coughs> Another key element of the strategy is that once energy zones are identified, development is limited to those lands. This stands in stark contrast to the department's approach to oil and gas development, which has been to make all lands available for leasing without considering other values or strategically prioritizing these lands. This has resulted, as we've all seen, in significant controversy and precluded thoughtful management of the public lands. Focusing on lands that don't have sensitive resources and are close to transmission will minimize environmental damage and loss of other uses that is honestly associated with large-scale solar development. An important siting option is found on brownfields and other already disturbed lands like abandoned mines or fallow agricultural lands. These are found on both public and private lands. Both the EPA and the National Renewable Energy Lab have estimated that these types of lands could provide up to 950,000 megawatts of utility-scale solar. These sites are close to population centers and transmission, and they are already zoned for industrial uses. They actually improve communities by reducing blight. They're in, were in place already in Colorado at Fort Carson, and in my home state of New Jersey, a landfill has recently approved a brownfield as well. Both the EPA and Arizona BLM have active brownfield programs, and these really could and should be expanded and incentivized, including through a renewable electricity standard. Chairman Markey raised the profile of this issue earlier in this year in a letter to EPA Administrator Lisa Jackson, and we hope to see this continue. But because development of solar at a utility scale will transform the land and preclude most other uses, it is important that we look at all types of on-site and off-site mitigation measures, base them on credible science, and take into account the many other uses and values of the public lands, things like wilderness values, wildlife habitat, and recreation. Everything from backcountry hunting and mountain biking should be accounted for. And new transmission is needed, but again, this must be done with a thoughtful approach to protect the environment and avoid further contributions. We would also encourage that while the Department of Interior is hard at work simultaneously developing a program, identifying zones, and analyzing many pending applications, including those receiving stimulus funding, they will need to be assisted with additional resources so that they can actively manage this program. Similar funding was assigned in the prior administration to fund oil and gas permitting, and the BLM will need similar funding from this administration. They have a unique opportunity although a challenge to develop this from the ground up. In conclusion, we believe that we can move forward with large-scale solar energy development while protecting and valuing other resources. Just wanted to note that the Secretary's order specifically noted that additional excuse me, policies might be needed uh, to fully support renewable energy, including revising the geothermal, wind, and west-wide energy corridor programmatic EISs. And we believe it's imperative that we improve those as well as the oil and gas development.
Thank you, and I look Thank forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Culver, very much. And uh, our next witness is Dr. Stephanie Burns. Dr. Burns is the Chairman, President, and Chief Executive Officer of Dow Corning. Uh, she is the recipient of the 2008 Commercial Development Marketing Association Award for Executive Excellence. We welcome you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you, Chairman Markey and Representative Sensenbrenner for extending an invitation to join uh, today. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, as you know, America is at the dawn of a new energy era, a transformation that will provide us with more clean energy, producing options like solar, wind, and other renewable energy sources. Dow Corning is one of the world's leading producers of polycrystalline silicon, which powers the solar industry. I know firsthand that America's energy transformation is inexorably linked to our nation's economic and manufacturing future. Such a transformation will require that we forge a new path forward through federal leadership, the investment and innovation of private industry, and integrated policy prescriptions that address each step in the renewable energy value chain, from education and workforce development, to raw material and end product manufacturing, to deployment and market readiness. With forward-thinking leadership and management, this transformation could bring with it a whole new set of industries, hundreds of thousands of new jobs, a sustainable source of economic growth, and a reduced carbon footprint that is good for our country and for our global environment. Other nations have enacted aggressive policies to support the growth of the renewable energy industry. For example, China, as you mentioned, India, and Germany offer large subsidies for solar manufacturing facilities. As a result, the U.S. global market share of solar manufacturing has dropped from about 45 percent to only 7 percent in 12 years. It is time for America to enact policies that will keep the solar industry here and at home. With that in mind, let me thank you for including the Alternative Energy Investment Credit in the Re American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. This credit is a significant <laughs> first step towards establishing new clean energy technology manufacturing jobs here in the U.S. and encouraging companies such as Dow Corning to manufacture solar and other renewable energy related materials in America with the potential to create more than 315,000 jobs in construction, engineering, science, skilled trades, and others. I hope that this credit can be made permanent in an energy bill now under development or in any other tax extender packages as it will propel America into an era of sustained renewable energy use and help put Americans back to work. Dow Corning is already leading by example. We are one of the only companies in the world that is able to provide advanced silicon-based materials and services throughout the entire solar value chain, from solar cell and panel manufacturing to module assemblies, right on through the panel installations. And we are making significant progress. Earlier this month, we announced the commercial availability of a breakthrough solar cell encapsulation technology that improves performance of solar panels and effectively lowers the cost per kilowatt hour of solar power, making solar power less expensive to both produce and to use. In the past four years, we have announced more than $4.5 billion in investments in solar technology including last December's announcement of more than $2.2 billion to increase polysilicon production, creating 1,800 construction jobs and more than 1,000 permanent jobs in the months to come. All of this to be put in America. And we have begun construction of a new manufacturing facility for use in thin film solar production, which will produce even more solar-related jobs and help attract other supply chain investments to the U.S. This is a start. But in order to truly implement the transformation which is before us, Dow Corning proposes a four-point plan to address the technical, legislative, regulatory, manufacturing, and workforce-related factors. America's ability to develop a thriving, domestic, renewable solar power depends on this. First, we encourage Congress and the Obama administration to act new federal policies and regulations that will encourage the rapid growth of a viable renewable energy industry and consumer adoption of renewable energy through federal <laughs> tax incentives to spur domestic manufacturing, a robust federal renewable electricity standard, and federal interconnection and net metering standards. 
Second, we advocate increased federal funding for research and development to accelerate solar technology innovation and advance solar manufacturing jobs. Third, we support the need to develop a green collar workforce by supporting training programs like the programs Dow Corning has co-sponsored with local colleges in Michigan and in Tennessee. Fourth, we need the federal government to lead by example in the implementation of clean technologies through procurement of on-site generation, building retrofits for energy efficiency, and new green building standards. Finally, but certainly no less important, Congress must ensure that new policies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, such as carbon tax or cap and trade, do not inadvertently discourage growth in the manufacturing and production of renewable energy resources. In closing, as I said earlier, America is at a dawn of a new energy era. My company is doing its part to encourage a climate of collaboration, creativity, and commitment to greener energy security. It's more than just smart business. It's as a global company, we know it is fundamental to protecting our nation's competitiveness in the decades to come. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Burns, very much. And our final witness today is Dr. Gabriel Calzada. Dr. Calzada is an associate professor in the Department of Economics at King Juan Carlos University in Spain. He is also the author of the report study of the effects on employment of public aid to renewable energy sources. We welcome you, doctor. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Chairman Markey, Congressman Sessenbrenner, and members of the selected committee, thank you for the invitation to testify today on the Spanish experience in renewable energies and specifically in solar uh, energy production. Spain, as you know, has, been, uh, has become a world leader in the production of solar uh, and renewable energy thanks to a mix of political determination and a huge amount of subsidies. In year 2004, Mr. Zapatero promised, I quote, a reorientation of the energy model towards renewables and particular, particularly solar energy. And he added, quote, this is the model of the future, end quote. And we did it from uh, year 2000 till 2008, we went from having almost no megawatt installed in solar energy to be one of the world leaders. How we did it, well, the way we did it is through subsidies, as I said, public aid, and, uh, and specifically primes. In the case of solar, we went so far as giving 575% prime over the market price in the so-called feed-in tariff system. In this way, we, uh, provided $40 billion uh, uh, to the renewable uh, industry and uh, $13 billion to the solar industry. Uh, uh, so we are talking about uh, an industry, the solar, that uh, provides less than 1% of the electricity and gets, uh, between these those years, uh, we're committed 13 billion euros to, to that industry. Obviously. Every Spaniard wanted to enter this business, and we got waiting lists. Uh, we have a large waiting list for, uh, from Spaniards wanting a, a license to produce solar energy. But, uh, and related to this, a lot of corruption, you may have read in the newspapers, a lot of cor corruption uh, arose because nobody wants to be at the end of the queue, everybody wants to be on the front. But even worse than this has been the bubble, the renewable bubble and the solar bubble that was created. In order to understand the bubble, you just have to think that uh, most of the jobs, the so-called green jobs that has been created, are in installation of, of those fields. So if you want to keep those jobs, you cannot maintain a level of subsidy. You have to increase it. You have always to increase it because you have to keep them working. So it means you have to keep them producing new plants. But if they produce new plants, you will have to subsidize more, megawatt, uh, more, more uh, electricity uh, that is produced by those plants. In this way, it's a, it's a bubble that grows and grows, and the Spanish government now has a very, uh, has a lot of problems related with this, with this bubble. Nobody knows exactly how to, how to solve the problem. Uh, another big question is who pays for this, all these billions? Uh, the first thing Spanish politicians did is look to the consumer, but uh, this, uh, they, they thought this was not a, a good idea because the, the, the price of electricity would have to, uh, to be increased uh, quite a lot. Then they look at taxpayers, but uh, 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 politicians do want to be re-elected and they thought the taxpayers 
uh, are also voters, and they dismissed this possibility. The third possibility was the distributors of energy, and, uh, and finally they obliged the distributors of energy to pay these high primes. Uh, however, the, the distributors said immediately, wait a minute, if we have to pay these very high primes to the producers of renewables, but you government set a very low price in the electricity that we have to sell, we will go bankruptcy. And the government immediately said, don't worry, uh, what we will do is that we will repay you, we promise we repay you in 15 years. In 15 years from now, uh, uh, when I'm not going to be here anymore, uh, another politician is going to repay you. And, uh, uh, and they encourage the companies to do sec securitization, securitization of this debt. However, since year 2007, uh, the utilities had not been able to sell the securitization, these packages in the market, and a uh, lot of trouble uh, have, uh, have arose in the electricity, in the, in the Spanish electricity market. And many, many so-called green jobs have been fired since then because the government had to change a little bit the subsidies to the solar uh, industry. Thanks to this scheme, uh, 50,000 uh, green jobs have been created. However, if you take into account the huge amount of resources that I just mentioned that has been taken away from the rest of the economy and put into, into, into this sector, uh, you can see that for every job that has been created, these same resources in the rest of the economy would have created 2.2 jobs for every job. So it means that, in fact, you are losing jobs and you're not uh, creating them. For every solar uh, megawatt that was installed, nine jobs were lost. This is the sad experience that our uh, that, that your president suggests should be taken as a model. Uh, I'm sure I'm sure that Spain uh, has many many good things to show, many economic good things to show your country. But I believe, as an economist, that uh, this uh, this uh, policy related to renewables, specifically solar industry, is not one of them. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor, very much. Now I'll turn and recognize the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenau. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for your courtesy. Um, I, I appreciate uh, the interest from a number of our witnesses uh, dealing with our current tax policies. And I, uh, as a member of the Ways and Means Committee, I'm very interested in our uh, being able early in the game to extend the investment tax credit. Um, working uh, with you and welcome any uh, suggestions or assistance to make sure that investment funds that uh, include tax-exempt entities are in fact eligible so we can dramatically increase the pool of investment that is available, which seems to me to be very common sense and uh, uh, would have effectively no economic impact as far as the federal government is concerned, but uh, open up the <coughs> pool of, of capital. Uh, I was interested, um, and Mr. De Rosa or others might have some uh, information for us um, ab about the effectiveness of the various tax credits as opposed to using a direct grant. Um, you mentioned the effectiveness um, where you're not uh, paying a, a premium to uh, other investors. You're not having as much complication in terms of accountants and attorneys, some of whom are my best friends. I have nothing against them. <laughs> but if, if there would be a way that you might be able to help us clarify the impact, and I, I'm not expecting that you have something here that you can pull out of your briefcase, but if you could help us just generate information about what the difference is for projects that you're involved with, uh, with the grant versus uh, tax credit, um, at a minimum, maybe some suggestions that we might simplify the tax credit application as we move forward. Um, I would appreciate it. Uh, I do appreciate uh, Dr. Pern's notion about the federal government leading by example as the largest consumer of energy in the world. Um, the Department of Defense or GSA, there are lots of things that uh, potentially we could uh, work on uh, together. Um, I was interested, uh, Dr. Calzada, um, as I'm listening to your comments and I'm looking at information that we've been provided, uh, we find that the United States National Renewable Energy Lab, which we think is pretty reputable and straightforward, um, repudiates your report. 
suggesting that it lacks transparency in supporting statistics, fails to compare renewable energy technologies with comparable energy industry metrics, it fails to account for issues such as the role of government in emerging markets, fails to account for the success of renewable energy exports in Spain, fails to account for the fact that renewable energy deployed, deployment creates additional indirect jobs in communities where renewables are being deployed and produced. I'm from a community that uh, benefits from one of your renewable energy companies that has its American headquarters in Portland, Oregon. But I, I would like to focus on one element that concerns me, um, uh, the, a, an account of your report in the Wall Street Journal um, says, and I quote, the study doesn't actually identify those jobs allegedly destroyed by renewable energy spending. Could you elaborate on specifically what jobs were destroyed and provide the committee with a list of them? Yes, sir. Well, the first or the second? Uh, the the list of the, the jobs that are destroyed. Good. The, the, the real, uh, about the Enreal, uh, this uh, agency, this state agency, what they, what they have criticized, they, they criticize us, us for using consensus economics uh, about the crowding out effect. They criticize us for not speculating about this year or future years. Uh, but it turns out that this year has been uh, very bad for, for green jobs. Many have been fired. They criticize us for not speculating about hypothetical export sales when the reality is that we have taken them into account. Uh, we have incorporated them. We look at what is and what was, but uh, an export was part of it. Uh, and they criticize um, uh, uh, excuse me, specifically I, the, for- the, Excuse me, doctor. The question I asked you was what are the jobs that were destroyed? Yes, what are the jobs? Do you have a list of the jobs that were destroyed? The jobs destroyed are 2.2 .2 jobs for every job created because you took the resources away. This is an uh, opportunity cost analysis. It is a real world analysis and it's the way companies uh, do their analysis. Uh, the other way of doing it, as Enreal suggests, is using a methodology that was designed for central planning, economic central planning, that is the Leon TF uh, methodology. You might want one or the other, but our is a real world uh, methodology and shows that for every uh, job, 2.2 .2 jobs were destroyed. If I take all your resources away uh, that you use you, for, for, you, for your you, staff, my time is you, cannot, you cannot hire your staff. Uh, my time's expired. I would appreciate it if you would provide to the committee, I don't want to put you on the spot and limit you just to a minute or two, if you could provide to the committee a list of the jobs in Spain that were destroyed by virtue of this, we would appreciate it. Thank you very much. Congressman, you have to ask this to the Spanish trade unions or to the Spanish government. I can provide you with what has happened, with what has been the reality, how many jobs, this is standard economic procedure, how many jobs would have been created in the rest of the economy if we wouldn't have taken these resources away from the economy? It's a very standard, and I'm sure you understand. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Thank you. Um, excuse me, just a moment. Uh, the gentleman, the gentleman can have as much time. Thank as you. I, I'm most most appreciative. Uh, I am very embarrassed because I can't recall which is, and I missed your testimony. Uh, the folks from the NRDC. There's someone from NRDC here. Am I missing here? The Wilderness Society. Excuse me. And that is Ms. Culver. Thank you very much. I'm, my apologies. <laughs> I just want to ask you a question. I've read your testimony. I just missed your name, but I've actually been briefly reading your testimony, and you were talking about. Uh, having a no net loss policy on a variety of, of characteristics on federal land um, for habitat, for recreational activities, those kind of things. I just wonder if you could address to what extent you think we, we are doing that in the current permitting process and how you would suggest we move forward to, to in fact, effectuate that, I, that idea. 
I, I don't think it's been explicitly laid out in the permitting process. I think it's been happening, it, it may be happening in an informal way. Um, more of the permitting process to date has focused on the siting issues where we've been able to, to have input about relocating or redesigning projects. Um, there, it's coming up more in California already, I would say, where we are having more anticipated losses of habitat that we can quantify. So I haven't seen it happening to date. Um, the BLM has uh, some internal guidance on both on-site and off-site mitigation that is very broad and allows them to design off-site mitigation policy that can take into account a myriad of ways to, um, as long as they identify the values that are being lost, be it habitat or recreation opportunities, they can design ways to <coughs> do the mitigation. It could be done through a fund that was created as part of a project. It could be done um, by identifying additional lands that could be acquired for the agency to manage. Um, it could also be done at a level of identifying similar areas that could be protected or managed specifically for a lost resource. Um, one of the analogies that I had heard was, for instance, when FERC uh, permits dams, they also require an applicant to build boat ramps so that the recreational opportunities can be replaced. Now, it doesn't fit quite as well for solar energy, but that type of model, I think, could work. So is the Bureau doing that, at least to some degree now? Are they looking to mitigate some of these? They are, they are um, not doing it at this point that I've seen, um, but, I, but I've I talked to them a lot, and um, <laughs> they are thinking about how best to do it, and they could use some direction uh, about how to move forward with using this very broad guidance they have on mitigating impacts, which, as you can imagine, is extremely right. broad. Right. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Calzada, I read uh, uh, some criticisms. I, I had proposed uh, essentially a feed-in tariff. We use a different name on this side of the water, but we'll use this name because it's one you've used for the moment, um, suggesting that it was unwise uh, for us to pursue that since Spain had had this bubble develop. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm not the total expert on the Spanish system, but I think that our proposal has learned from the Spanish experience, we have in our proposal incorporated some measures that would prevent a bubble. One, a step down of the price to take into consideration of the economics of the situation. I think our proposal has a more realistic uh, time frame as far as the rate of acceleration. I would characterize the Spanish acceleration, as you have to some degree, as precipitating a bubble that was unsupportable and just the rate of acceleration was too great. And in our legislation, we have sought to learn from that experience, build in some safeguards. And I think uh, looking at the German experience, we can succeed in this. The Spanish experience, I don't think, should be uh, taken as a, you know, uh, convicting a feed-in tariff for all time that it should never be pursued. It's just that you need to design it correctly. That's what I would take from the Spanish experience. So I would. If you want to comment on that, uh, feel free. Is that is that really what the lesson we should be? We should show some care when we design a feed-in tariff system. I would say that uh, what I have studied is the Spanish case, uh, obviously. And uh, as long as the other cases, other new cases, are similar to our case, uh, the results should be very similar to the one. This is this is our the warning of my team of my researchers is, is this. So just to let you know, uh, at least from my review, I, I think that the NREL uh, research is, is credible. It's the one we'll be looking to to guide us in this regard. And I think they have concluded that your research, although I'm sure sincere, was not uh, necessarily the gold standard on evaluating this issue. And, and we're going to be following their conclusions. They're going to be moving forward with this. By the way, I may add that the Chinese are now looking They've indicated they'll be uh, adopting uh, a somewhat similar policy. This has been spectacularly successful in many places in the world, not the least of which is Germany, and I hope that we'll be able to pursue this. Thank you. Great. Um, recognize the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I must uh, appreciate Mr. DeRose's point about the cash for clunkers. I mean, I. I found myself voting against that, even though I think it's probably a, a nice thing to do, but tripling the, that program when we didn't know what we were 
penalizing gave me pause. Uh, I'm wondering if you have some thoughts about how we rebalance the equities in terms of replacing that money. Do you have any targets, uh, as subsidies for <coughs> other types of energy? Uh, anything come to mind to, to put the money back in the bank? Uh, I, I <laughs> appreciate the question. I, I have not uh, looked into that. We would be happy to, uh, to, to look into it and see if we can uh, come up with some ideas for your consideration. Well, let me elaborate, and uh, uh, because we've we've had uh, we've got um, three witnesses who are very much in the business of trying to develop an American presence in one of the most rapidly growing areas of economic activity globally. Uh, which the majority of us on the committee think is uh, critical to uh, uh, the survival of the planet uh, the way that we know it and our economic competitiveness. Uh, a recent Environmental Law Institute study suggests that, well, it didn't suggest, it found that uh, the United States provide fossil fuels with about two and a half times the subsidy of renewables. <laughs> Um, any thoughts about sort of rebalancing uh, the playing field here so that uh, we, we aren't in the position, which my friend Mr. Sensenbrenner talked about in terms of picking winners and losers, uh, but trying to um, uh, promote uh, sustainable evolution, particularly of emerging uh, important technologies for the future. Mr. Doctor? Um, I, I would just support uh, the concept that you're putting forward. I mean, we, 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 we sell our starting material to almost all of the manufacturers in the value chain. Um, over 65% of what we make goes offshore to someone in Asia or Europe or someplace <coughs> else to convert into the finished module. Then it comes back on shore and these guys install it. And I think anything we can do, number one, to, to grow the market demand for solar and renewables in America, shift, shift from fossil to incentivizing this growth, and secondly, attract the solar manufacturers in the value chain to this country. Um, those two things, to me, are a winning combination. Any further thoughts, uh, Mr. Klein? Mr. I would offer, sir, that just one way of thinking about it is looking forward as, as we seek to decarbonize the entire economy, one way of, of looking at, at evaluating uh, the need for incentives would simply be on carbon content um, that, that would naturally move you towards investments in, in, in clean energy. Yeah, if, if I could echo that, uh, we, we consider ourselves you know, uh, market participants, and and the th this committee has documented the you know the consequence of of climate change. The, the the I'll say simple. It's the most difficult thing, but is to uh, to account for the externalities, and and then there are no. You're not picking winners and losers. What you're doing is you are. Uh, you're, you're making an economy more efficient. Right now, our economy is not efficient, right? We're using too much energy because uh, the, the, the true cost of that is, uh, is not accounted for. And so if, I mean, so, so that's the challenge. It's to, it's, to, it's to put a price on carbon. I mean, I would argue that of all of the uh, alternatives out there to reduce carbon emissions, the one that's most proven is renewables, and I mean, you know we're we're just starting in things like carbon sequestration, and so I would say that it's renewables that is actually the market clearing price for what what the true cost of carbon reduction is. Now you have the difficult task of, you know, uh, of uh, stepping into you know, 200 years of, you know, of, of precedent and trying to, you know, trying to figure out how to uh, make that right, uh, given the hand that, you know, that we're dealt. But, uh, you know, to me, it's the, uh, it's not the, framing it is not difficult. <laughs> 
Thank you very much. Great. Chair, recognize the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inns. Thank you. I'm very appreciative of the emphasis to make sure we get this uh, money taken out of a renewable account or restored. I know the speaker is totally committed to this. I think we're all up here are committed to this. I spoke to the chief of staff of the White House last week. They are committed to this. We're going to be diligent to making making sure that happens. I have a question about the uh, the cost of solar power has declined on a real basis with increased in volume and a fairly consistent level and gradient. Uh, is there any reason to believe that that will not continue at that same gradient per volume? Is there some hope that will actually go down faster? Can you give us any predictions in that regard or thoughts? You want me to, um yeah, you're, oh, I'm on. Um, yes, the cost is declining uh, with with volume and with with investment in research that is showing how to make these cells more and more efficient. Um, and and our our view of it is a linear line. What what will help is if we do increase demand and that that increases significantly and exponentially, then those costs should go down even greater than the linear line today, because you're going to start to get some efficiencies of scale and more investment um, in new technologies. I mean, you've seen this in electronics industry as we've uh, become more and more efficient in semiconductors and other things. So, so I anticipate that that would, would happen. And, and you've seen great changes. I mean, I just read the Department of Energy um, payback analysis, which was from 2004, their assumption in that analysis was a 12 percent efficiency cell. Um, you know, people are up to 16, 18 percent, and thin film is, is even higher than that. So I, I would anticipate any time you put this much research investment into a field, you're going to continue that trend. Of course, the Boeing subsidiary Spectre Lab is even higher than that, but yeah. they're the world leader. I want to get the parochial local <laughs> plug in that regard. Um, uh, one of the attractions of the feed-in tariff, I think, is that it, it has an incentive that is appropriate to the state of a given technology. A renewable energy portfolio we have is a great tool. We're going to adopt it. But it's really sort of a one price for all technologies, and technologies are different levels of development. So it really is an incentive for the next most affordable renewable energy, not the second most re affordable energy. And right now, frankly, wind is, is still cheaper in most places than solar. One of the benefits of a feed-in tariff is it, it provides an incentive for multiple technologies appropriate to the level of maturation of that particular technology. And this has been successful in places that have done that. And by the way, governments have been successful in ramping down that price. I was talking to a solar cell manufacturer in Dresden, Germany, last year, and he was, you know, tearing his hair out because the German government was forcing down the price. But that was appropriate to do with increasing scale and decreasing costs. Mm -hmm. So I guess, is that a fair assessment? Is that a virtue we should pay attention to to move forward with the feed-in tariff? Um, any thoughts in that regard? Do you want to speak and then go ahead? Sure. The, the, the best, uh, I think the, uh, the biggest advantage of a feed-in tariff is, is its predictability. You know, you you, uh, you you know you know what the price is. Uh, I think we need to be careful about uh, where where we set that. And and uh, in fact, the California Public Utility Commission is grappling with that issue right now. They've they've issued a, a report that uh, is recommending a feed-in tariff for a certain category of renewables. I believe it's up to 10, 10 megawatts uh, with a another. Uh, caveat for for 20, and they're inviting comments on how how to set that price. Uh, so uh, I, I think that the uh, so far what what we've done in the United States is, and Steve Klein can speak to this uh, is we've had a competitive process uh, where we have an RPS and and. Uh, people like us bid uh, competitively to meet that demand. Uh, I think that uh, that has been uh, uh, slower than uh, people's uh, expectations. And so something like a feed-in tariff carefully drafted, I think, could address that. Well, let me tell you, here's my concern. My concern is if we rely exclusively on the renewable energy standard, it will develop ultimately 
the next technology in line for cost quite effectively, which frankly is wind at the moment in most places. But it will not, in a time-sensitive manner, develop the second, third, and fourth technologies in line of maturation. And it is clear to me that we're going to have to have technologies three, four, and five to get to that 80% reduction by 2050 that we need. So I believe that it is imperative that we adopt another tool that will jumpstart numbers two, three, four, and five, that I believe this is really the, the best mechanism for doing that. Now the alternative is to continue with our RES, mm -hmm. and 10 years from now we'll get to technologies two, three, four, and five, but we don't have 10 years to wait in that regard. We gotta start now on all of these. So uh, I will be looking to your advice on how to pursue that, and I hope that we do so. Thank you. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair will recognize himself for um, <clears throat> a round of questions. And first, I have a, I ask unanimous consent to have included in the record correspondence with the Department of the Interior and the Department of Energy on solar development, and ask for unanimous consent that these letters be included in the record without objection, so included. And I also ask for unanimous consent to have uh, a report from the U.S. National Renewable Energy Laboratory responding to the Spanish jobs report study also be included in the record at the appropriate point without objection. That also is uh, so ordered. Um, let me turn to you, uh, Dr. Burns, if I may. Um, could you explain the relationship between Dow Corning and the fiber optic revolution of the 1980s? <laughs> um, that would be Corning <laughs> Incorporated um, and actually using our materials in fiber optics. Um, but Corning is a shareholder of our company. Yes, but they used your technology. They used our technology. Your fiber optic technology. Our, our um, advanced materials that they converted into yeah. fiber optics. Yeah. Correct. And, and that's a very interesting story, is it not? that? Uh, up until 1983, the only way in which we transmitted information, AT&T, of course, was the only meaningful telecommunications company in the United States, was over copper wires. And then we broke up AT&T as a nation. <laughs> and the first call that went from MCI went to Corning to use your materials that Corning of New York was putting into these new fiber optic technologies, using light as a means of transmitting uh, information. And that's where the fiber optic revolution began, using your materials. Yep. Huh? Yes. And um, it, it seems kind of funny that you look back and you say, well, Alexander Graham Bell, who invented the phone 100 years before, and by the way, using light, but he couldn't figure out a way of dealing with uh, weather and uh, other circumstances. So he was kind of waiting for the kind of materials that you were developing so that it could be transmitted in a way that wouldn't be subject to weather and other sources. So all of a sudden, Alexander Graham Bell, up to 1983, is actually still able to recognize the phone system because it was the way he invented it. It's the way a phone call had been moving all those years. And in a lot of ways, um, that's really what we're talking about uh, over here with the smart grid. The smart grid makes it possible for us to use the telecommunications revolution to bring in the sun and the, uh, and the wind from the deserts and the prairies uh, off of the ocean, off of people's roofs, and to begin to integrate it more into the totality of the grid that we have in our country, and it makes it a lot more affordable. Of course, it took the, the Corning, the Dow Corning revolution uh, in fiber optics in order to make all of that possible so that ultimately we could move to a broadband technology. Uh, but now we have this uh, next uh, uh, revolution, and people are, you know, arching an eyebrow saying, well, could we have the same kind of revolution here in energy that we had in the telecom sector? So my question to you is this. You've heard the conversation, Dr. Burns, about 
um, solar. And you talked about a thin film solar technology, which Dow Corning has. Uh, could you expand a little bit upon that and what your hopes are for thin film solar, and especially in terms of its price point as each year goes by, yeah. and maybe using 2020 as a kind of an outside year in yeah. terms of what you believe the, the price of solar-generated electricity can be uh, using thin film solar? Well, I think, first of all, I think there's going to be a lot of different solutions to this renewable challenge, um, from wind to, to photovoltaics. And I think there's going to be a place for thin film in that equation, as well as more, the more rigid modules, depending on the needs and the building design, if, you, if you're putting it on a building. But thin So film, the reason we're having this hearing is just solar. Okay, we're trying to put, yes. you know, kind of put a, the, the, bring in the, the sunshine and, and put it on the solar issue. Wind gets a lot of attention and, you know, hybrid vehicles and batteries. Well, so I can tell you, we decided we'd have can, our solar only so, hearing. Solar cells have come a long ways from the one that's hanging behind your chair in your <laughs> office. <laughs> Um, yes, I think, you know, we are marching on a path where we are going to reach grid parity with these technologies. When do you think that will happen? You know, there's a lot of variables in that whole equation, but I believe we're going to find it in the next two to five years. Two to five years? Yes. Now, it depends on where you're located and how much sunshine you get, et cetera, et cetera. But these technologies are moving more and more efficiently. And Now, when you say grid parity, are you talking about equating the cost of generating electricity from solar with generating electricity from coal? From Yes, from traditional sources. From coal, coal. Yeah. yeah. Natural gas, hydro. So two to five years, did you say? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, it, and in some countries, as you, as you know, like Japan, um, they're at grid parity now. And certainly at grid parity during peak use hours. Yeah. So that's, that's a big news story. People don't talk in those terms. People still think of solar as, you know, some distant dream that might be achieved in the next, you know, generation, not something that is basically um, right over the hill and, uh, and, and could be in place within five years competing effectively with coal. So where, where, where do you think that would be possible? That is, in what, what, perc what percentage, for example, of American consumers do you think could benefit from those kind of breakthroughs? Well, these guys, these guys probably have a better answer than I do because you know I'm so far up in the in the value chain. But I, you know, my view is that you know where solar right now is less than one percent of our energy contribution. That should be up in the 5 to 7% over time. And I don't know how much time that's going to take, but that's a huge expansion in solar power as, as a source of electricity. Well, we had Dr. Emanuel Sachs testify in July before our committee. And he's the founder of the company Evergreen. And now he's founded a new company called 1366. He testified that he believed that 7% of all electricity in the world could be generated from photovoltaics by the year 2020. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's just some Panglossian number that is pulled out of the sky, or do you think there might be some basis in I that? I think if we're smart about it, we could achieve that. Now, that's, that is just amazing, because again, people focus so much, as Mr. Inslee said, on wind, and, we, and even in our deliberations on the bill, we spent so much time on biomass and uh, other issues. But this solar issue really has a, a, a capacity huh? with the proper funding and public policy. Exactly. The, the right investment in research, uh, policies to grow the market, and policies to encourage manufacturing investment. And do you believe that your technology at Dow Corning is at the cutting edge in terms of thin film solar? I, I think our... Um, Special, specialized silicon-based materials are at the cutting edge. There are other companies that design the cells, I design see. the modules, design the thin films, who, you know, there's a whole array of companies. So you're just, you're like, the, you, you provide the materials. You're, you're like the arms merchant. Exactly. All, all these solar companies, <laughs> all these solar companies will come to you, and they're going to have their, their hope, race out there. We hope they do, yes. to, Well, are they, are they coming to you? Yes, absolutely. And, and, and they're coming to us 
uh, to get advice on investing in the U.S. to make their, whether it's their cells or their modules. Mm -hmm. And uh, how many companies have come to you? I would say more than five. More than five? Five major players. Major players. How do you define a major player? Either as a cutting edge innovator or a leader in their segment. Okay, and amongst the, and are they well-funded companies? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so they're, and, and are, are they buying into this idea that there's a two to five year horizon on thin film solar? They're, they're making some tremendous investments and that's always based on your business evaluation of your potential. So this is private sector, venture capital money being put up to uh, place money on this bet. Or, or or large public companies who are choosing to invest in, as part of their portfolio. We do have some smaller companies coming and working with us. And to echo some of the issues that were raised here, um, they do have an issue with access to capital mm -hmm. and ability to get get the loans that they need to, to make their investments. Okay. So as you as you use two to five years as the horizon to establish parity between photovoltaics and coal as a source of generating electricity. Even if you're wrong, do you think 10 years from now there's a chance that you would be wrong? No. By 10 years, it's a, it's a done I deal. So. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you agree with that, Mr. Klein? I, I think that it's, it's very possible. I think one of the challenges will be uh, it will be somewhat dependent on two things. One, on the extent to which we uh, we use wise land planning and are able to actually take advantage of areas where there's great celerity. And secondly, um, on building the transmission needed. I guess, yeah, I guess uh, she, we're talking about two different technologies. You're talking about thin film solar, which isn't as dependent upon the Bureau of Land Management. Well, huh? I'm talking about the absolute efficiency of the of the technology of solar in general. Yes, exactly. I mean, I see. These are these are even bigger and more important issues in terms of how do you where do you put it, how do you transmit it, okay. and, and how do you consume it. Okay. So you're saying, just so we can divide the question, you're saying the technology is going to be there. The breakthroughs are just happening so quickly. The improvement in the efficiency, the lowering of the cost, and so then the question comes. Where are we going to put it? How quickly can we do? It? How quickly can we do it? Uh, and how do we raise the capital in order to ensure that we do it uh, in a way that we capture the benefits here in the United States? So then we come back. Let me let me go to uh, Ms. Culver, if I may, for a second. We'll we'll go over here to our Bureau of Land Management uh, expert. Um, w let me ask this: What what is the land requirement for a large solar project? Ms. Culver. That might be something better for our friends from Nextlight to. Uh, All right. Well, let me. I'll come back to you with a, a with a related but question. It's, let, it's let me, significant. Uh, significant, but just give us an idea in terms of uh, square miles. Sure. So our uh, Antelope Valley, California project, with with which we have a, a power purchase agreement with Pacific Gas and Electric, it's 230 megawatts, and it will cover about 2,100. Uh, acres. 2,100 acres. Yes. Okay. So um, let, me, let me come back to you, Ms. Culver, if I could. Uh, how much acreage does the Bureau of Land Management have under its control? Do you know? Well, that I do know. <laughs> uh, over 260 million, about 262. 260 million acres. Mm -hmm. Yes. And do you know how much of that acreage um, it leases out to the oil and gas industry for its, its use? I believe it, at last count we were uh, well over 40 million. So 40 million acres of public land under the control of the Bureau of Land Management is now leased to the oil and gas industry. 40 million. Yes, over 40. Mm -hmm. now, and Mr. DeRosa, what are you looking for? <laughs> 2,100 acres. 2100. The, the size of a farm. 2,100 acres. Okay, wow. So that's quite a difference in terms of the use of public lands in the United States. And you'll be able to generate how much electricity? 230 megawatts. Okay, so is for that, so for the purpose... Which is a mid-sized power plant. It's a, it's a good-sized power plant. So out in, Dia, out in California, Diablo Canyon is probably a 1,000 megawatt nuclear power plant? About 2,200. 2,200. 
it ruins my train of thought here. Um, um, <laughs> oh, that's okay. San Onofre is 1,000 megawatts? I think that's right. Okay, good. Thank you, Mr. Doros. That's the correct answer. And um, <laughs> uh, um, yeah, 1,000 megawatts. So you're, you're going to produce approximately a quarter of a nuclear power plant's uh, generating capacity huh? with your use of essentially a farm uh, to install your solar uh, technology. Uh, yes, based on capacity. Based upon capacity, yes. And thank you for that clarification, but yes. So I'm just trying to tell a story here so that people can have an idea of the ballpark that we're in. And it does, it's not Fenway Park, it's Yellowstone Park, but just so people are in the conversation and they can understand the scale of what we're talking about. So again, going back to Ms. Culver, 44 million acres for oil and gas industry. And over here, we're looking for some policy that allows for wind and solar, but solar today, you know, to also be put on public lands and to be given, giving them that opportunity. So Mr. Klein, why don't we come back to you and uh, talk a little bit about the amount of, uh, of, uh, of space, acres, square miles that you think PG&E is going to need in order to generate the solar uh, that uh, you're going to need uh, to meet your goals for renewable electricity in California. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I would have to uh, go back and, and actually look at those numbers and add them up and, and give you a precise number. But I think if you use Mr. DeRose's um, uh, acreage as, as, a, uh, as an example, um, and you multiply that by... By about 20, say. Uh, again, this is off the top of our collective heads, but okay, that would give you an idea. Okay, but they're very knowledgeable heads, and so, um, so in terms of megawattage, what are you talking about? Well, 20 would be about 4,500 4, 4, megawatts. megawatts, and if you just scaled, yeah, scaled up the the amount of acres would be. 20 times two, 40,000 acres. 40,000 acres, yeah. yeah. 40,000 acres to match two Diablo Canyons or four San Onofre nuclear power plants. Yeah. Um, so um, that's, that's big news, you know, that, that's, that's a incredible, and, and, you got, and you're committed to doing that, that you are two companies, yeah? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, and you would not be going down this path if it was not economically viable. Uh, well, with the caveat that in California we have a, an RPS. Uh, That's a renewable electricity yeah, standard. Yeah, it's precisely. A certain it. percentage of your electricity has to come from renewables, yeah. Yeah, so, so, we're, so we're driven uh, to, to find the most cost-effective renewables, and, and that's where they are right now. Solar is... It, it, it is where we are focusing a huge amount of our attention. Yes. Now, again, a lot of people think that wind is the is the future, but you've chosen solar. The, the issue for us is that uh, there's bountiful wind in California, but it tends to uh, to all blow at night and frequently very late at night. And until we get a means of storing that energy and being able to use it uh, when we need it. Uh, the beauty of solar for us is that it is right at the time we need it uh, absolutely the most. Mm -hmm. And again, that, that's why you know we put so much money into the stimulus package for yeah. battery technology and why we will continue to fund battery technology. Um, again, the good news here is that um, if we could store the electricity generated from wind and solar and then use it when we need it and have battery technology massive battery technology which makes that possible. And we've really got a good thing going. And the good news here is that we're not talking about putting a man on the moon, you know, and sending him up there. By the way, that was 49 years ago President Kennedy was talking about that. Can you believe that? And we put a man on the moon and brought him back <clears throat> um, uh, eight years after the president uh, challenged our nation to that. 
And by the way, they were up there all alone. I mean, that was tough up there. You know, they were riding around. Remember, they were riding around in their vehicle up there, and whatever was powering that probably, you know, some renewable energy was definitely powering that vehicle as they were bouncing around on the moon. And then they figured out how to get back in that thing without Houston ground control right next to them, and they came back. So we're not actually challenging people to do that. We're just asking people to build a better battery. You know, seems like mm -hmm. <laughs> a more prosaic job. Uh, we just didn't pay attention enough to it. Uh, and once we put our minds to it, it seems like we should be able to develop batteries that can store electricity. Mr. Klein. I, I would just offer, I'm sorry, I would just offer that it's even broader than batteries. I mean, there's a whole assortment of compressed air and other uh, technologies that, that uh, we and others are experimenting with. So I think I mean, the beauty is, we, again, we have technologies competing against each other. Mm -hmm. It may be batteries or it may be compressed air. Yeah, but again, once you say there's gonna be a renewable electricity explosion in California and across the country, you give a huge incentive to private sector companies to start investing in the storage technology because those companies are going to become very, very wealthy. Uh, whoever can provide the storage capacity to all 50 states and to every utility in the country that is now going to be generating electricity. So again, one revolution begets the next. So the telecom revolution um, creates the fiber optic broadband revolution that then makes the electricity internet possible because all it is is a broadband management of electricity. Uh, and then that revolution begets, you know, the the, the, the smart grid revolution starts to beget the, uh, the battery revolution and other revolutions because you have to, you know, now the private sector companies can see the opportunity as to where they are going to make a fortune, maybe become the wealthiest pe people in the history of the world, actually, whoever can develop the battery technology. Competing, of course, with the people who become the, the, the thin film solar um, uh, leaders in the world. They might, everyone is going to be in a race here to pass Bill Gates as the wealthiest person in the world. It's whoever makes the breakthrough, patents it, and starts selling it to everyone else. And you have to believe this, you know, uh, in order to move in this direction. But again, we're not talking about putting a man on the moon. We're talking about things that are relatively prosaic and incrementally, you know, Ms. Dr. Burns referred to this drop, this kind of Moore's Law in in uh, photovoltaic, how it drops 18% mm -hmm. every year in cost and improvement in efficiency, and it's occurred every year since 1979. So this is not something that is uh, you know, fantastical. It is something that is happening in the real world and has reached a point where she's saying in two to five years, it'll match coal, match natural gas in terms of the cost if we can create the marketplace. Mr. DeRosa. Yeah, and, and, and we believe, that we at NextLight, we believe that, and, and we think that there, not only will there be cost reductions due to technology efficiencies, but there'll be cost reductions for the other half of the cost, which is the, the, the construction of these facilities. The construction of it, the balance of plant, is half, half of the cost, and the, those, those economies are just getting started. I, I think... The, the obstacle we face now is, and I, and, and I agree with Dr. Burns, that it, it, we're going to need all the applications. We're going to need sm the smaller rooftop <clears throat> applications. We're going to need the, the, the smaller, uh, more uh, urbanized uh, uh, solar applications, uh, as well as the large power plants. Those large power plants have not been built yet. And so, it's not a technology question. It's it's a financial. It's a financing question. It's we need to demonstrate to the people who are going to put up the money that they will get their they they'll get their money back. And so, what what are the financial people concerned about right now? Uh, they uh, lenders, equity investors are uh, they're cautious of investing in something that hasn't been done before. So are they most concerned about, you know, Dr. Burns talked about kind of the incredible advances made in the technology you have as well. Is it, is it the technology that they're un, uh, uncertain about or is it the BLM regulations, the ability to get access to the land, the, the, the guarantee that it's a predictable uh, investment tax policy? Could you go down the list of the things that you think are 
most important in terms of creating an uncertainty in the minds of the private sector? Sure. So at Nextlight, we deal with proven technologies. Uh, we're, 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 not, we're, we're not trying to advance that second or third generation. We want to get that first generation in first. And uh, we need to deliver to investors uh, a project with four corners around it that uh, does not have environmental problems, that, that has its permits, that uh, is, is a good product for the utility, that has a, an interconnection, uh, a, a viable interconnection. So that's a given. Then the, uh, what the investor will, will look at is, uh, has it been done before on this scale? And that's the hurdle that we're at right now. It's, it's been done in one megawatt blocks. It's been done in five megawatt blocks. Uh, but a two, 230 megawatt project, and it's not just our company. There's many companies out there developing utility scale. And we all think that's what we need to meet our goals. Uh, it's even though one, one could say, well, two, it's, it's just 230 times the one megawatt project. but. Uh, it's, if you're the one putting up the money, you're, there's a lot of questions that you ask, and you ask about supply chains, and you ask about construction process, and, and all of those things. And so that is, uh, that is our challenge. It's to uh, take this proven technology and, and uh, convince the investors that it is proven. It's, uh, it, it, and, and it will, uh, but just by scaling up, uh, it, there's, there's nothing different about it. And that's where, if I could just, one more thing. And, that, and that's where the DOE loan guarantee program comes in. That's where the, um, the ITC grant comes in as well. Uh, and by the way, on, on the, um, <laughs> that cash for clunkers, uh, temporary depletion of the renewables <laughs> program, on the House floor, the speaker and the... Um, chairman of the Appropriations Committee did promise that the money would be completely restored. So that was all part of that very uh, same day debate mm -hmm. that included the cash for clunkers uh, and the, this rule. So the, the commitment was made in floor debate at that time. So uh, I think you can pretty much take that to the bank. Um, so the, um, uh, let me come back to you again, Ms. Culver. Okay, the interior. Department estimates that there are 2.9 million megawatts of solar potential in the Southwest on public land. Uh, we have, in the whole country right now, we have 1 million megawatts of electricity uh, that exists, that is the capacity. And we use about 450,000 um, megawatts of that on a daily basis, but it's about 1 million megawatts of capacity. Uh, that is out there. Um, and the, the Department of Interior has estimated, uh, again, that there are 2.9 million megawatts of solar potential in the Southwest on public lands. So that would be almost three times the total um, electrical generating capacity over the whole country today. A fantastic number. Um, so the Department of Interior, including BLM lands, uh, equals about 500 million acres. So could you talk a little bit, Ms. Calva, about kind of the regulatory tensions that exist here between the preservation of the environment and the installation of these technologies that put us on a very fast path towards energy independence and uh, solving the problem of uh, global warming? Sure. Um, I think there's been a lot made of the tension that has not quite come to bear. We have, of course, had a few conflicts over project siting, but the solar energy study areas that were recently identified and where the comments have been pouring into the Bureau of Land Management are looking at you know 670,000 acres that have been identified as close to existing transmission, not having a lot of environmental conflicts, and being very much suitable for solar energy development at the utility scale in terms of both the potential it would generate and the terrain. So I think at the first stage that the tension has, the tension is interesting for people to write about, um, but the tension in the actual process itself has not been quite as 
high. And we are talking about 260 million acres, as we just talked about. Of that, the, the BLM's National Landscape Conservation System, which are basically you know, the crown jewels, wilderness, wilderness study areas, national monuments, conservation areas, it's about 26 million acres. So we're not talking about um, you know, a, a giant portion of the public lands that are currently locked up from energy development. Again, give those numbers again. They're about 200. The nominator, the, the denominator, and the sure. numerator. Yes. Um, of the 262 million acres of the Bureau of Land Management's lands, approximately 26 million, a little bit more has been added in the last omnibus, but uh, of those are dedicated to the National Landscape Conservation System, which incorporates wilderness, wilderness study areas, national monuments, national conservation areas, wild and scenic rivers, and national and historic trails. Mm -hmm. So we, we do not have a situation where the vast majority of the lands are somehow locked up and we're going to have to do um, drastic measures of things like fighting over wilderness study areas. It, we, it doesn't need to come to that. It shouldn't come to that. Okay, great. Let me come back to you, Mr. DeRosa. How, how, much, uh, how much public land are you going to be using? We have a combination. Our, our projects, uh, some of them are on public land, some are on private land. Uh, we have two active BLM projects right now, you know, roughly in the two to 4,000 acre range, about the same size as we mentioned before, 250 megawatts. And are there any environmental issues surrounding those, the, the, the land under the management of the BLM? Uh, we feel- in the, projects that, in the projects that you are focused on. Right, Th those are going well. We, They're going well. We have uh, one in southern Nevada that was uh, designated by the BLM and the Department of Interior as a fast track project in southern Nevada. And we have one in Arizona that is in the second tier of, of, uh, of the package of projects. And is this all part of the 230 megawatts that you're talking about? No, these are two uh, separate, two, two, separate pro we'll two, talk two additional the, projects. We'll talk about the the, the, the 230 okay. uh, megawatts uh, project. So that, that is in the Antelope Valley of California. It's on private land. It's private on land that we own. Mm -hmm. It's a former farm that uh, is not being farmed anymore because there's not enough water. So it's fallow land. It's a great, great location, great site for solar because it's, as, as we would describe it, it's previously disturbed land. It's been cultivated before. So, uh, so far we've, we've had, uh, unanimous community support and support from the environmental community as well. Okay, and so what are the obstacles then? You, you, don't, you don't appear to have any land management issues and environmental issues. What are your issues that are remaining in terms of the construction of that project? It's financing. Financing, and the financing is contingent upon, again, if you can just say the words, uh, the confidence of the private sector, yes. and they're waiting for what? Uh, <laughs> they, they, they're, they're looking for uh, uh, a, a dem they're, they're looking for a demonstration that uh, they will, they will get their, they will get their money back. It'll work, and they will get their money back. Okay. And what can demonstrate that to them? Um, I think it's, it's a combination of, as, as I said, a, a solid, a rock solid project with a, a credit worthy off taker for 25 years, and. Uh, the, an off taker is uh, uh, could be differentiated from an undertaker. <laughs> what, I, I've never heard of that so, before. So, off taker. So, sorry for the no, uh, that's okay, trade yeah. lingo. Uh, it, it is a, the purchaser of the power, the the, public, yeah. the, the electric okay. utility yeah. Yeah. who purchases the power. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. And so, what what's your level of con what level of confidence, Mr. Klein, can PG&E give to Mr. DeRosa on his project, and to the um, are you the principal investor in this project? No, we we are the purchaser. Of you're the, the off taker. We're the off taker. Yeah, you're yes. the off taker. Yeah. Um, so uh, so who <laughs> are you partnered with with uh, with the investors or is, are you just standing on the sidelines waiting for the project to work and then you'll take it if they can get it done? It's the latter. Yeah. And and historically, when when the markets were working, uh, projects like Mr. Rose's. Um, when, when they had a signed contract from a, a creditworthy entity like pg e could take those to the bank and finance them. Yeah. And, and the issue right now is they cannot. They cannot. Well, <clears throat> and the reason they cannot, Mr. Klein? 
uh, because the credit markets are frozen and and that kind of lending project financing just isn't occurring. I see. So this this state of economic uh, it, it, it's kind of cryogenetically, you know, frozen right now, and we're waiting for it to uh, to warm up. But let me just ask this: you are, but you are basically saying, can I just PG and E is saying to um, your company's name again? Next Light. Now, you're saying to Next Life. Next Light. Next Light. Yeah, <laughs> Next Life Light. gets back yeah. into Undertaker. But the the the. <laughs> But next light, you're saying to next light, if if you build it, Mr. Next Light, we're buying it from you. That's correct. You're saying that to them. Yes. Okay. And then you're saying, Mr. DeRosa, to the investing community, PG&E says if if we build it, they're going to buy it. Okay. We got a letter promising us that, huh? And yeah. so this cryogenetically frozen credit market is in pretty sad shape if you can't rely upon this rock at Gibraltar, which is PG&E, it's not going anywhere. It's got a state law saying they have to buy renewable electricity. You're going to be able to produce it, and if you can get it done, you've got a guaranteed market, and your investors are you know, smiling all the way to the bank, right? Yeah, it's our, it's our job to, uh, to get it done, as you say. So that, that introduces, then, the importance of the DOE um, loan guarantee program, huh? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so if yeah. you've got a loan guarantee program, that you can also rely upon, mm -hmm. then that gives more confidence to the private sector investors that they're not in this alone, huh? A absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so I, I actually I, I'm kind of heartened by this. You know, uh, Miss Burns is uh, Dr. Burns is is uh, I'm married to a doctor, so I apologize for that. Uh, Dr. Burns is telling us that um, that uh, the technology is there; it's moving along. She's got the materials; she's willing to sell to anyone. Uh, and she's guaranteeing improvements as the years go by. Uh, Ms. Culver is saying there's public lands available, 90% of it, that would be usable for solar technology and that it's out there and wouldn't have a lot of environmental or regulatory problems in using it. Uh, Mr. DeRosa is saying that he's, he believes that utility scale technology is the way to go uh, and that if you can, if you can uh, have a marketplace in California's Building it here with the with the mandate that the utilities have to come have to receive a high percentage of their electricity from renewables um, that uh, and with the DOE loan guarantee program that it might not be today it might not be tomorrow but it's happening pretty soon this, this it's a lot like Corning Dow back in 1983 with the fiber optic revolution you know it's 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 just now a question of when this inevitable revolution just breaks through uh, because we are going to continue to see the, the dramatic decline in the cost of producing this solar generated electricity. For, for this and other projects, it'll be 2010, it'll be next year, that many, hopefully many projects will start construction. And why do you point to 2010 as the date that you think the kind of the dam breaks? 2010 is the uh, December of 2010 is the deadline for the investment tax credit grant. Ah. And that is a, uh, an important component in the financing because it makes the financing just that much more streamlined. It, it, uh, it eliminates the need for this complicated tax equity investor in the projects. All right, so the combination of state renewable electricity standards and the existing and the existence of an investment tax break is going to put a lot of pressure on investors to kind of close the deal to get the benefits, you know? Yeah, yeah well, we're, we're spending millions of dollars at risk uh, developing these projects, and, and I think uh, <laughs> investors and lenders uh, would be eager to invest with that combination. Okay, that's great. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to ask each one of you to give us your summary, one minute of what you want us to remember about this uh, hearing and, uh, uh, and, and what the takeaway is from this uh, incredibly optimistic view of the role that solar can play that uh, I take from this hearing. We'll begin, it will go in reverse order, and we'll begin with you, uh, Dr. Uh, Calzada. I would say... <clears throat> that when you look at uh, new investments, especially when there are technologies that are not 
uh, ready now, you should uh, have the feet in the earth and uh, look at past experience. And uh, of course, there is a place for new technology, innovative technology. This is wonderful, but there is an institutional place for the, those, this venture capital, this, this is the stock market. And I think that those technologies have to be improved there because uh, um, uh, forecasts, there have been many, many forecasts in, in, in the history. For example, I have here a forecast that President Carter was making in 1978, saying that uh, by year 2000, 20% was going to be solar. And forecasts, there are many. The problem, forecasts, when the private citizen does a forecast uh, and invest and make a bet, in a bet, nothing happened because it's his money. But when a, a, a politician does this, the problem might be that it puts uh, people's money there, and I would say keep feet in the earth and look at past experience, not only in Spain, but in other countries too, to, to see what has happened in Thank reality. You. Thank you, Dr. Calzada. And uh, since there's no one else here, you know, I'm going to alter what I was uh, already putting in process here and getting the final statements. Just to say to you, Dr. Calzada, that yes, Jimmy Carter did say that, and uh, and he was putting the policies in place to do that. He did not predict that he was going to lose to Ronald Reagan in 1980, however. And he did not predict that Ronald Reagan would name a dentist, James Edwards, as the Secretary of Energy in February of 1981. And that, uh, and that uh, Dr. Quote, Dennis, dentist uh, Dr. Edwards would then pledged to abolish the Department of Energy by May of 1981, which was his cause, that was his goal, to abolish the Department of Energy because he did not want any national planning for energy policies. And, um, and while there was a beautiful analogy there between Dr. Dentist James Edwards and, and the drilling that he had um, perfected in that profession and kind of the affinity that he had for an equivalent technology in oil and gas that also had drilling. Uh, it did exclude, unfortunately, um, uh, oil, uh, 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 wind and solar and geothermal and biomass from his vision. And unfortunately, the Reagan administration lasted eight years, uh, also something Jimmy Carter did not predict. And, um, and unfortunately, the next Bush administration and the Republican control of the House and Senate for 12 years uh, did not accommodate that technology either. Uh, and so if you, you, if you look backwards, you can learn from history, but you have to understand that sometimes um, history uh, does not repeat itself. And here, it is not going to repeat itself, okay? We're actually on day one at 8 a.m. of the Obama administration. It's going to last at least four years. Um, the states now have, in the absence of federal action, put their own renewable electricity standards on the books. Um, uh, and, uh, and last year, there was 9,000 new megawatts of wind and solar installed in the United States and 9,000 new megawatts of natural gas and only 1,500 new megawatts of coal. So the revolution's on, okay? Just, it's just how quickly now we're going to accelerate it. As Dr. Byrne said, it's, you know, two to five years, if, you really, if we're optimistic and it continues to move at this pace, but in 10 years, it's a done deal. So that's a different world. And, uh, and, and while I love the Carter focus on these issues, uh, that was 30 years ago. And we did miss a huge opportunity. We should have already completed the revolution by now. But we were focusing too much on drilling and not enough on relatively prosaic technologies if they had been given uh, the right kinds of incentives. So we'll turn to you, Dr. Burns, for your final word. Thank you. I believe we are in a new era of renewable energy, and solar is extremely promising. Uh, I encourage us to, to put in policies and regulatory practices that grow demand, uh, because we're on the pre precipice of uh, achieving uh, energy efficiency and parity. I think we should do more to attract manufacturing investments. I think it's a crime that most of the manufacturing is done offshore for our needs. Uh, and I can tell you green jobs are real. I look them in the face every day uh, with the investments that we're putting in place. Yeah, and, and just to follow up here on Dr. Burns, China, China is already the leading exporter of solar technology. So it's no longer just Jimmy Carter talking about the United States. China is now industrialized. India is industrializing. Germany has targeted solar uh, as 
uh, one of their principal long-term manufacturing sectors. So we no longer have the luxury of just sitting on the sidelines here. Otherwise, we'll wind up importing it all anyway because we're going to have all these state and national requirements that we have uh, renewable electricity. Uh, and the only question now is, where is it going to be manufactured, here or overseas? Because these laws are not only not going to go away, they're going to get strengthened as the green generation of young people come along and demand that it be strengthened as every year goes by. So that's the challenge for us. It's to make sure that Dow and, and other American companies are producing the jobs here. Uh, Ms. Culver. Well, on the BLM lands, we do have 44 million or so acres under lease for oil and gas, and we don't have large-scale solar projects. So what this really shows is we're starting from the ground up. It's an opportunity. There's this challenge, but there's an opportunity, and I really want to encourage us to learn the lessons that some of us have learned from the oil and gas program and to embrace this opportunity. The program that's being built right now is a revolution of its own in, in management, and I, I think we need to support it um, and go forward with this approach of actually identifying and prioritizing and targeting the right lands for development and acknowledging that there are lands that are not appropriate for development right from the start. Um, what we've been seeing here is a very different approach where we have multiple opportunities for participation from the public and from state and local experts. So we have people who know and people who care, and some of us actually both know and care, and we're, and we're getting a chance um, to improve the projects and to be able to support them. And so I think if we continue down this path, we're going to be able to uh, achieve some development. And, and Dr. Uh, Ms. Culver, do you know how many um, acres the BLM leases for coal development? I don't know that number off the top of my head. You don't know, but that's a large number. Yes, huh? a large number. Potter River Basin, et cetera, that's, that's a lot of area. I'll bet you that area alone is enough to generate, uh, the, although it probably isn't as sunny as it should be, uh, as it could be in uh, Potter River Basin. I think you could ask them to share their land. <laughs> There's a lot of land that's under lease that's not being developed, uh -huh. and they could share it with our, our friends Sharing. in the solar industry. Yeah. Yes. Kind of a good kingdom garden concept, yes. and we can try to apply that here to solar and coal and oil and gas. Dr. Uh, uh, Mr. DeRosa. Thank you, Representative Markey. Uh, the ingredients are in place for near-term, uh, I think, dramatic acceleration of solar energy development. The, the market demand is there. We've heard today the uh, technologies are there today with even more impressive technologies uh, coming in the future. We, we have a uh, determined Department of Interior and Bureau of Land Management to uh, utilize uh, federal lands for renewable development. And we have a DOE loan guarantee program. We have an ITC, an ITC grant. Let's keep those in place, and let's pass the Green Bank so that this isn't just a first wave, but it's a sustainable development of solar energy. And, and the Green Bank that you're referring to is the uh, provision in the Waxman-Markey bill, which will leverage upwards of $75 billion worth of investment. Uh, in advanced technologies, not just solar and wind, but nuclear and other advanced technologies, but that green bank would be there as, as a permanent fund to be used in order to fund these new um, uh, technologies. Um, Mr. Klein. Uh, three things, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the first, uh, mechanisms to, to create scale nationally. Um, as Dr. Burns suggested, that's some form of a national RES that's a very well carefully constructed feed and tariff. It's something that, for, that creates national scale, um, you know, beyond California and a few other states who are doing this. Uh, continued financial support, as Mr. DeRosa described, and predictable, transparent land use programs for, uh, for federal land that uh, allow uh, these projects to get constructed and the transmission related to them get constructed. Thank you, Mr. Klein, very much. And we thank all of you. This was a, a two-hour hearing to the minute, and, uh, uh, and it was very helpful. It will be on the record, uh, and it's going to help us a lot over these next several months to ensure that we put the right
permanent policies uh, on the books to uh, ensure that we complete this revolution. Thank you all so, so much for your help.